Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 88. This episode is Elroy Spoonface Powell, who's just the best. He's really, really cool, and also one of the most motivated people uh, I've ever talked to. Is really, really inspiring. Uh, but if you're in the UK, you probably know him from the early 2000s. He was in a, a group called Black Legend, and they had a number one record, uh, which was a cover of You See the Trouble With Me by Barry White. And he was a singer. He's a great, great singer, all-around great performer, actually. Uh, so we talk about what that was like to basically be thrust into the limelight, having his first hit be number one on the charts, and what that was like, how he navigated that, um, what it was like going on tour for a lot of years, and what that does to you mentally. Um, we talk about uh, him doing martial arts growing up, and then how martial arts has influenced pretty much everything that he's done, um, and the, the unseen benefits of that, which was really cool to kind of dive into and to get his kind of headspace. Um, and then going from being in the music industry for so long at such a, at such a high level to then switching over to acting, and then getting thrust into the deep end there as well. Because he did EastEnders, he did uh, uh, he was in Star Wars. He was in Episode Seven. He was in most recently Fighting with My Family, uh, the movie about the uh, wrestler Paige, which I really recommend. It's great. Um, so he's got stories about uh, working with Nick Frost and how cool that was, and different fight scenes that he's done for other shows. Also, check out his book called uh, How to Think Beyond a Chart Position by Elroy Spoonface Powell. Uh, it's it's great, and he really dives into the psyche of somebody who's behind the scenes of the music industry and what that's like and how to navigate it and a uh, hundred things he wished somebody would have told him. <laughs> it's it's great. It's great. And uh, we dive into how he got the name Spoonface, where that came from, what it means. It's really cool. Uh, all kinds of stuff. What a great dude. I love talking to people who uh, are so multifaceted and have so many cool interests and have succeeded in, in such a way that not a lot of people have, I think. So it's interesting to get that sort of perspective and what that's like on the other side of success and then how to handle it. You know, it was great. It was really, really cool. Um, you guys are going to love him. Elroy's awesome. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it with the man Spoonface himself. Uh, the episode number 88 of the interesting podcast, Elroy Spoonface Powell. Let's do this, my friends. Theme song time. What's uh, what's the future like? The future is looking great. Good. Uh, the, yeah. At least sure. the next five hours, we're gonna make it. And... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've made it to one p.m. So so far, one p.m. is pretty good. Yeah. What time is it for you? It is eight a.m. Oh, nice and early. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good start. Good start. Can't complain. I made it up, which is the greatest step forward already. <laughs> you know, Indeed. some Absolutely. people not so lucky, but I'm dude. I'm so excited to talk to you because I love talking to actors just in general. But you're what I call like the little extra because you can act and you sing and you dance. It's like I feel like people are naturally creative, but some people are so creative they're like multiple outlets. And I'm like I want to talk to those people. So, Matt, I really appreciate you reaching out, and and I'm happy to share. And it's it's I think it's great what you're doing. So yeah, let's do it. Oh, stop it! <laughs> <laughs> but I I am wondering though, being that you have all like these creative outlets, well, I need to say first, I'm a fan of your music. I am what? aware, and also a big fan of your music videos. Which oh boy, we gonna get into. But did, <laughs> <laughs> were you as a kid? Were you more into acting or singing, or how did that even come about? You know what? As a kid, I grew up in this household where my dad bombarded us with reggae music oh, sweet. Um, all the time. And um, and so it was just in me. But I didn't actually want to become an actor or a singer. Uh, it just sort of uh, happened organically. I got involved in music and had a number one record 
Yeah, you uh, did. Yeah, um, before I before I even ventured into acting, and um, you know, I was I was exploring. I'm always very creative and having fun with expressing myself through these mediums, you know. And um, eventually, we landed up here as me being an actor uh, from the uh, music industry. Right on. That's cool. So, at what age did you realize you can sing like Barry White? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I woke up one day and my my voice definitely uh, was sounding very different. And all, all my friends and everyone made me very aware of that when I hit school. <laughs> um, Fair. Like, you know, what happened, what happened to you last night? Um, yeah. <laughs> I found it. That's what happened. <laughs> I found it. I found my groove. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, but I, I always loved messing around with reggae and, and, and melody. And um, I went to Jamaica when I was a kid and it, it, it's just the heart of the culture, you know, and yeah. came back. And it, yeah. And it was just nonstop. I just sort of had this thing, this constant rhythm, this groove, this melody inside that I, I wanted to explore. Sure. Uh, and that's how it sort of happened. That's so cool. Dude, I love reggae music. I love music in general. The music's awesome. And reggae is such a specific type of music. It's one of those, like, reggae you have to feel. You know what I mean? Like, there's some music that's more, that you can take, like, a more technical approach to it. Like, with classical music and, like, with the piano, you've got your 98 keys and you've got your musical theory. But reggae seems like one of those genres that's just, like, it's almost like you can't teach it, almost. You either have it or you don't. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, for me, it's really interesting because they spent a lot of time covering all kinds of songs from country to R&B and, and all sorts, as well as this real kind of, when we hit the kind of roots and the, the kind yeah. of, uh, that, yeah, like real social commentary and not being afraid to speak out against injustice and all of that, which was really attractive. Absolutely. Man, I'm so into it. I can't sing at all. So anyone that can sing, I'm like, man. If I could, it's one of those other things, you know, if there's things that you can't do, you're always like, if I could, though, man, I'd, I'd be, I'd be someone else. I'd be somebody, <laughs> you know, but that's yeah. cool. That's cool. But I, th but I think the main thing that alongside martial arts, when I was a kid, um, were the things that helped me, um, connect with myself and sure. start to find this confidence, you know, to just, to just, just be who it felt right to be. Absolutely. So wh what martial arts did you do? I started off with uh, a lot of Taekwondo when I was a kid. Love and, it. Uh, yeah, my instructors were just really kind of serious. And uh, we had fun, but they were hardcore, you know, and really pushed us hard. Sure. But we loved it. Yeah. I bet. A lot of kicking. Taekwondo. A lot of kicking. A lot of kicking. But also, um, they had this very 360 approach. So we did locks and throws and takedowns and... Um, it was very much about developing this kind of internal strength, you know. Yeah. Not, not giving in. Absolutely. That's the biggest benefit uh, of martial arts is, like you're saying, that confidence. Because you, you learn to defend yourself as well, but you're also getting physically stronger. And then there's the mental aspect, which, like, martial arts is 90% mental. And then you can carry that. And it's kind of served – it's served you pretty well, man. Indeed, man. Indeed. So you, you do martial arts as well? I did. I did. Uh, I did Shore and Rue for like three or four years. I did. I studied Kendo for like ten. Uh, wow. And uh, you know, I was like, using a sword these days is practical. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's uh it's great. It's great. I really like it, and it has those hidden benefits. It's interesting that I've talked to quite a few other artists, actors, and musicians and stuff that also did martial arts. And how it kind of coincides is pretty cool. Yeah, it's very interesting that um, there's a lot of musicians and creative people that, that have done martial arts, and that connection is definitely there. Yeah, yeah. And it for somebody like you as well that has like a an identity, you know, that you're putting out there through your performances and stuff, that further enhances it so that you wouldn't be as influenced from outside sources. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Did you were you were you singing to them as you were beating them? <laughs> <laughs> Be honest. Oh, you can I say feel, yes. Feel, if only I should have I should have really. <laughs> they'd have to they'd have to pay me extra though. That's right. Yeah. Thing. I'd have to charge extra. That's right. Sure. You charge you charge them for the song, and then if they don't pay, they get an extra beating. <laughs> this, this is a racket I'm going to help you with. All right. I'm I'm an ideals I'm an ideas man. So, so you know I'm here I'm here I'm here for you. Is what I'm trying to say. 
But nowadays, I'm doing a lot more um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Gracie jiu-jitsu. Oh, and, um, very different my, from Taekwondo. Very different. How are you liking um, it? I love it. Right and, and, it, and it was scary for a long time. Yeah? How come? Well, because you, I'm a big guy, and sometimes there are guys bigger than me, and you have them on top of you trying to oh, choke you point. and break your arm. And you feel like the world's closing in on you, and you can't get out of this box that's suddenly been created. Sure. Uh, but then when you start to learn how to breathe and relax and just, just be patient, and it starts to come together, um, it's, it's, an, it's amazing what it does for you internally as well as externally. But internally, it's a great, it's, a, it's just such a special thing that I'm so glad I discovered. Sure. Uh, I'm still learning, still early days for me. I'm a purple belt now. Um, with, there you uh, go. <laughs> yeah, I'm with Professor Eddie Cohn. Right um, but I head out to LA uh, a couple of times and I hooked up with Heron Gracie, Professor Heron Gracie at uh, Gracie University and Henna. Love it. And uh, special people. And, uh, you know, I love Heron does this um, yearly jujitsu lifestyle summit where people from all around the globe come together and exchange and we, we have special guests um, giving really? us insights. And, oh, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And it's blown my mind and really helps me um, with certain elements of my personal journey, you know, sure. for real. It's become, it's become like a spiritual thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. It's, it's great, man. It's, 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 that th it's my happy place. It's my happy space for sure. That's so cool and so important, especially nowadays. Like everyone needs a sort of like area where you can recalibrate. Because we're getting bombarded with so much information all the time. And yes. with like a physical outlet as well as a mental outlet, that's where kind of martial arts shines, I think. I agree. Pretty neat. Yeah. And jujitsu is another one that's like with, with jujitsu, you're rolling. You know, so you're like in someone's face with your hands on them. And like it's very tactile, you know, which just it, it's like in those situations, you can't think about anything else. So it can become like a form of therapy. Yeah. yeah. Pretty neat. 100%. Yeah. Pretty neat. So you were singing growing up just because you had like a musical environment and stuff. So your number one your number one record, which I am very familiar with, hence the very whiteness, uh, did, was that something that you like planned? You're like, all right, we're going to do this. Or did you kind of fall into that? I fell right into that. Really? You know, I was, um, yeah, I was studying law at the time. I was a student. What? And, um yeah, I was headed in that direction. I wanted to do that whole thing. Dude. And, uh, <laughs> that's so different. <laughs> and <laughs> left time. turn. Left turn. Yeah. And uh, a real special person to me called Lisa Millet. She's a singing, my singing instructor, but she was also an, an artist in her own right with Defective Records at the time. And um, she said, look, look, there's some friends of mine in Italy. They need someone to revoke with this thing. You have a deep voice. You know, look come see me, let's go out there, let's see what we can make happen. And I just wanted some money. I was a broke student trying sure. to just get through. I was like, yeah, let's do this. And uh, went out there. It was one of the hardest sessions I've ever done in my life, goodness me. Really? Because Barry White, yeah, it was Barry White. Didn't just have a, a deep voice. His whole body was a resonating chamber. And I wasn't as big as I am now back then, you know. Sure. Um, so we worked it. We got it. We got it. We cranked it out. And by the time I got back, I was getting emails about, yeah, um, get ready. You're going to be doing at the time top of the pops and all this kind of stuff. I was like, wow, really? Dude. I had no idea what to expect, but my my world got flipped, turned upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the rest is history, as they say. Wow, that's a, that's such a singular experience as well. So when so when you came back, first off, you also had great hair. So I just need <laughs> just need to throw that out there. It's such a good time as well because that happened. It was like. Early 2000s, wasn't it, around that time? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Which is like the peak of like late 90s dance type of music. Like there's a specific sound that coordinates with like those from like 98 to like 03. Those five years, like you've got Sonic, you've got like all those sort of club music. But it's not like club music nowadays. I can't really explain it, but it was, yeah. it was a good time. Yeah, the house music with a fusion of the bits of funk and you know south soul and all these kind of these kind of grooves that are thrown in and yeah, like you said, you know, like even like Kylie Minogue and all that lot and your yes, Eric, Eric Murillo's and you know all of these people that were pumping out the house music and it was crossing over exactly. And so yeah, definitely a really interesting time. And you were a part of that wave. Pretty I was cool. part of that wave. Pretty yeah. cool. So then, when did you had like? 
what is that even like? How do you even process that sort of information when you were doing a job for a friend, basically, and it's like you have a deep voice, and next thing you know, you're number one. Like, I can't even I can't even imagine what that would do to your head to be like, okay, it, you just have to recalibrate everything you know now because your name's on charts with all of these other legends, you know? Honestly, it was probably about five years later. Oh, <laughs> that it, perfect. <laughs> that, it, that it hit me. Sure. You know? That makes sense. So is that is that it's, how you got involved with Black Legend as well? Was through the through this recording session? Yeah, that's how I got involved. Uh, Lisa Millet connected the dots and uh, yeah, that, that was it. Wow. Did you do concerts after that? Did a hell of a load of uh, PAs up yeah. and down. Yeah. Yeah, was, of course. You, like? uh, it was phenom- phenomenal. Just out three, four times a week. Um, wow. Performing, doing shows, meeting people. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. I'm glad I was so energized from all the Taekwondo I was doing at the time. Yeah. Uh, because it, it was brutal. It was really brutal. A lot of hard, hard work. Um, I bet. Just, yeah, but I, it's how I learned. I learned so much from just having to do it time and time and time again in front of all kinds of different crowds and uh yeah that it was phenomenal it was a, a great period in my uh in my life that i'll never forget did you find over time that like you could go into that like into the zone where you've done it so many times that you can just kind of be there and still perform yeah i mean it gives you a great bit of confidence i mean on on the flip side um before that again being a broke student yeah, I I did all kinds of jobs and and I did a lot of things like a, a window, window like trying to get double glaze with selling double glaze windows and yeah. uh, <laughs> like door to door selling perfume and sure. working in. So like I dealt with people a lot. I got used to dealing with people through that a lot. And so by the time I got there, I had a certain amount of confidence. But in terms of winning over a crowd and getting to getting them to connect with you. Um, that was a special skill that came with constantly being in in the faces of all yeah again all kinds of people you know sober drunk and in between yeah was there was there a learning curve having never done like those type of live performances before being shoved into oh hey it's the number one guy massively yeah it was a learning curve and then I had to deal with you know you get you get this massive um kind of the weight of expectation because now you've had this number one record and everyone wants you to have number one records the rest of your life yeah and they don't see that you don't necessarily have control over the the, the material you're making especially back then if you're signed to a label and they have ideas about what they'd like you to do Mm -hmm. and you're the front person you're not necessarily producing and so on so i had to deal with all that and um eventually it was only when i decided i was going to do what i wanted to do my way i got this sense of freedom and I had to rebuild my career um, with my own voice, which was which was great. I had it, w- it was so free being able to do that. Sure, sure, man. So, how long were you touring, essentially? Probably, probably the first um, three years were the most intense. But then wow. every now every now and again, you get a, re- a request for. A, a performance somewhere, you know, South Africa or Dubai or somewhere, you know, some shows. What? Coming up. That's far um, from where you are. That's very far. Um, yeah. Man. So that must have been crazy. kind of crazy. It's like, hey, it, countries away, they want to see you perform. Yep. Hella crazy. Man. Uh, so did you have in those times? Like, I'm I'm fascinated by process. So like, how how much time? When did you sleep? Because <laughs> you got rehearsals and travel, and if you're doing multiple nights a week, you don't sleep. We yep. sleep on the on Fair. the tour bus. We sleep on the yeah, and even like we had hotels. Like you, you know, every now and again, you get a hotel to stay in overnight, and so on. And after the show, you're just so wired that you just couldn't. I couldn't sleep a lot of the time anyway. I bet. You know, my brain was you know, and then you're worried about you think about family and how things are going back home and. It's actually a really tough thing. It's actually, you actually get very lonely at times. Even though you have a lot of people around you, I found anyway, it was hard because you got a certain amount of caution that you're throwing out there because you don't know who you can trust totally also. Right, Um, right. And you've got a small core of people, but there's only so much that you can share with them also because you just come from such different backgrounds and have such different um, things going on in your personal situation, you know, so... 
I found it was ve- I was very lonely for a long time, and I'm, I'm a, I was an only child for a while, so I'm kind of used to that. Right. But, um, but it was it was tough. It was a grind, and so when you did get home, a lot of times your family, you couldn't really relate your experiences. You know, they they couldn't really empathize with the, sure. the things you're going through. So that was it. Was also interesting for that, and I share that in the book. I wrote a book called How to Think Beyond the Chart Position. Love it. Um, and uh, I share that, those experiences, you know, and um, and I encourage, you know, emerging talent to think about how they can build and maintain community and find their own personal mechanisms for dealing with stress and loneliness and burnout and all those things that come with massive success at times. Sure, especially really fast success, because it's not like you were in bands trying it, trying it, trying it, trying it, and then you came upon this and was like just played the game you'd been playing already just on a higher difficulty. But it was like so fast. Right. It was the first song that I ever released. That's insane. And it wasn't just a number one record. It was a massive. It's really hard to put it into to context now, but it was so big. You had all of the tastemakers absolutely into it. And it crossed over into the mainstream. And then all of that lot were into it. And uh, it was at a time when people sold a lot of records as well to, to get the top spots. Sure. In the chart. Yeah, it's like it wasn't a lull where you just got in because there wasn't a lot there. It's like, no, this, this, especially that time, late 90s, early 2000s, like that's when you've got peak other bands as well and everything's going on and you still, and, and that's the thing with charts as well is when you're charting, like that's the massive PR boost for the entire region, you know, and then eventually the world because you're like, who is this? People will check it out just to see all the other people that you beat out, you know? Yeah. Pretty yeah. neat. Man, I've I've thought about that a lot with people that are performers that go on tour and get to that level of success. Because it's fascinating that you say that it's like really lonely because I can imagine that it would be because one, you're always moving because you're hitting different venues and doing all these things. You're in crowds, but you're up on stage. And then when you go home, like you're saying, you don't have anyone that can relate to you because like, oh, I, how I had all these people and it was crazy the last five shows and like I I was. I was here. I don't know what that means. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And you don't sleep, so that helps too. <laughs> Man, so when did, where did Spoonface come from? Because it's the greatest nickname I've ever heard. <laughs> so I kind of had this thing where you look into Spoon, you get something different, and that was always my approach with making music. Um, I don't want people just to expect me to be a rapper or whatever. You know, I was always into exploring different genres and seeing how they fuse together. And yeah. So I... At one point, I had an acoustic um, guitar and accordion uh, project that I did um, with like a reggae, soul, folk music vibe to it. That's incredible. And, um, yeah, and, and that's where Spoonface came from, really. That's cool. That's way better than like, oh, it's just a really cool nickname. You're like, oh, no, there's a philosophy <laughs> behind it. Dude, I'm into that. I'm into that. I know there were, there were uh, hints to that in the Too Fast music video. Where you actually, there is an animatic of the spoon face, which is you as a cartoon spoon. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And then you have the spoon, so that's kind of cool. So wh- how was how was that doing like too fast? And then somebody's like the greatest that time music video. Just want to throw that yeah. out there. You know, it's so it's so interesting. There's this kind of it's almost as if I was in two worlds um, because I came from this background of of hardcore reggae dancehall and then later on drum and bass and jungle and so on and um and then i was in very commercial house music and so i had a lot of fans because it's so widespread and and uh, big in certain places sure. and then sure. i had an audience that possibly didn't understand why i was doing house music like that you know what i mean right. it wasn't like it wasn't kind of like now where you got chris brown and usher you know hooking up with diplo and and, and like doing all these kind of um house uh, edm fused r&b and so on it, it people were a lot more closed-minded right you know right. What I mean? so uh i mean me i didn't care i did whatever it felt right for me to do That's but right. at the same but I, I was very aware of how some people just didn't get it um and for me i loved it and so i love going to italy i love going to that part of the world and they they just lapped it up they're just really into that that vibe even now like house music is very much their thing but i i still very much hold on to my dance hall and my reggae reggae roots and when i want to just uh 
chill out and disappear and dis- disappear into myself and just uh, contemplate life and so on. It comes on and off I go. Sure. That's that's really smart, I think, as well, to like keep a creative vibe going, to not pigeonhole yourself and put yourself into one box. Because that's kind of like how I feel. I feel like that's kind of like how the human brain operates sometimes is we need to categorize like you are this thing so that I can enjoy you as this thing. But as human beings, we're multi, multi, multifaceted. Uh, so when you're talking about mixing genres and guitars and accordions, that's awesome. <laughs> did, did, so did you have a favorite venue that stuck out that you're like, this is the place? Because a lot of artists are like, Manila, I like to go to Manila, it's the best. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, you know, for really straight up out and out house music on the very, very commercial side of things, mm-hmm. I love going to Magaluf and... Um, oh. And a place called BCM, because I, I, I was real good friends with a, a guy out there, a couple of guys who DJ and, and pretty much run the club, you know, mm-hmm. um, who made me feel very welcome, you know. And, um, yeah, I, so aside from that, I never really had any specific venues that I loved. It was more about who am I going to be performing with and around that I like hanging out with uh, in between and afterwards as well, you know. Sure. That's another thing people don't think about after the concert. That, yeah you know you gotta hang out with somebody that's where a lot of artists i think have trouble is when you go like the ultimate highs and lows where you've got on stage people chanting your name singing your songs ultimate high going to a hotel room by yourself ultimate low you know and like yeah. we're not wired to be able to handle those in such a short amount of time i think yeah absolutely and this is why a lot of uh artists end up self-medicating and feeling disenfranchised or isolated and all, and all of that stuff, you know. Mm. And uh, we, I feel that record labels and tour managers and publishers, more of the industry need to own this duty of care to to artists that are, are in these situations. I agree. I agree. It's Because they're carrying the massive amount of weight that goes along with it, but then the, the upper echelon kind of treats it as a product. The problem is they don't separate the artist from the art. So they start seeing the artist as the art, a.k.a. Right. a product. So it's a crazy business. It's a crazy business. I totally agree with you that the humanity gets lost somewhere. 100%, especially in something that's like a, a, a product, you know, because then you stop, you dehumanize the people that are actually doing it. But that's that's why I like to talk to people, to be like, oh, hey, let's bring that human element back. What was it like? Yeah. So that's kind of yeah. neat. What so what was something that you learned getting getting thrust into this so quickly? Cuz it had you done any sort of like live performance like concert type stuff before this? I'd done things like um talent competitions at places like uh Hackney Empire Sweet. and in shopping cities and all this kind of stuff. Even like or malls as you would say or like um at school, I did uh, loads of performances and stuff, so I kind of I, I I did that kind of thing, mm-hmm. but um, at the at the level that I was doing it with Black Legend and the frequency, or e- even to do television, because I started doing a lot of TV uh, performances. Um, what was it at the time? Like, yeah, Top of the Pops and Pepsi Chart and like uh, breakfast morning programs for young people, like yeah. CD, CD UK and. <laughs> all these things Dude. Get, getting on shows and answering questions and getting guns and all this kind of stuff um yeah i, I didn't have any practice for that but i guess i'd watch a, a ton of tv uh, and i just sort of i there just thought go. well let me just do do it my way and just go with the flow hey fake it till you make it there you go i totally believe in that you it, know it worked you, <laughs> yeah you didn't do like two performances and was like oh man we've made a mistake yeah, just 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 and enjoy it, you know. Just don't worry. I mean, it's so easy to get caught up in worrying about making mistakes and so on. I just thought, let me go for it. Let me just do the best I can because that's all you can do. I agree. I think there's freedom in that as well. When you've got like, truth is universal, in the sense that if somebody gets up on stage and they're unapologetic and they're like, "This is who I am," it almost makes people feel better about enjoying something, because you're like, "Oh, that's who they are," so I can be who I am. It's like this yeah. weird sort of like almost spiritual thing going on where all the pretenses are out. We're like, oh, it's okay to enjoy things and be ourselves? Uh, all right. 
and then the truth kind of comes out, and then you get actual joy. Hundred percent. And then, and yeah, but that thirst for creativity and exploring the different sides to me led me back to acting. Um, Sweet. Uh, you know, I, I went for a period actually where I was doing bits of erotic art. I was oh, more... sweet. <laughs> so I, was like, <laughs> I was, I was, I got, I got kind of bored with the industry. I got kind of uh, jaded as well. I just thought this is just boring. It's, it's tiring. It's... And so, um, I just got a ton of models in a hotel room and a camera, and um, done. Listen, and done. I just did some very tasteful. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very tasteful. I was very aware of that. Just making sure it was very tasteful um and did an exhibition out of out of that and then i thought why am i taking pictures of these models i need to get myself back in front of the the lens and explore where i can go with that and um dude the, yeah it went from there and then i got asked to do eastenders a po- popular uk huge uh, so. even i know eastenders <laughs> that's like the uk days of our lives exactly thousands so. and thousands wait eastenders was your first like big acting gig well, I, I got asked to do be, be a market trader for a couple of years. Sweet. Um, and, and then I started to do fight scenes. So I start, I went and did some training with the British Action Academy. Um, and then I got asked to do a couple of fight scenes. And I, I thought, let me just get a, a, an acting agent. Got an acting agent. And then I started doing um, commercials. And then this opportunity with uh, fighting with my family came up. Where Oh, yes, it did. With The Rock and Stephen Merchant and Nick Frost and the rest of the cast. I have to say, I absolutely love Nick Frost. Um, I was going to ask. I've heard he's amazing. He's he's a lovely man. You know, just really uh, humble, uh, funny, and, and just real, you know. Um, and uh, I'm sure he goes through a lot of things like we all do. But he was always, he, he is always so nice to me. Um, and it's cool. a pleasure working with him, man. And uh, yeah, that definitely was a real turning point for me in my acting career because especially now I, I, I literally just signed a contract for a, a film that I'm doing later in the year and all of these opportunities have opened up because of that film uh, for sure yeah and it's a great time I'm just really thankful really it's really it's really a great time well I mean you were amazing in it so there's that <laughs> yeah, like for real you were great because I, I I just saw that movie with my wife a, a few weeks ago and having no idea about the wrestling industry and how that goes i like walked out of that with so much respect for literally everyone who's ever done that and i'm like oh that's so cool and then one of the standouts of that movie was you and i was like this guy just something about him i was like i gotta get him on my show i was like i need to know who this person is because you're so good and you got dude you got to share a scene with nick frost and get hit in the crotch with a bowling ball who can say (laughs) that (laughs) you know (laughs) Talk about man, singular so experiences. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much, man. Of course. Much appreciated. Of course. No, it's much appreciated to you because you did it. I just got to enjoy it. So, hey, <laughs> that's a thing. So that's pretty cool. I'm seeing I'm seeing the thread here. There's that bit. And it's also interesting you say that, like, it got boring at the top of the charts doing this thing because you're doing the same thing every night. It's like we all have this idea that once you hit this massive level of success that everything's cool. And you're like, all right, well, I guess I'm set forever. But then you realize a dream job is still a job. You still go to work. You still do the same thing. And then you're going to be like, uh, what are we going to do in the downtime? And the answer is erotic art. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, got, I got tired also of the politics. And yes. the, uh, this Again, yeah, that and the weight of expectation. You know, um, you know, every time you even see family members, oh, wh- what's the next thing? What are you doing? Can you sing for me? And it's like, well, if you're a singer... <laughs> I don't know many other professions where if you turn up at uh, a meeting or something, people just want you to sing or perform. And I'm like, if you're an accountant, I don't ask you to do my taxes. That's true. <laughs> you know, give me a break. I just want to hang out. Exactly. You go in the dance, monkey dance. And you're like, no, and it's, I don't want to. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. Oh my God. That's it. back to the – oh, dude, it goes right back to the whole, like, art versus artist and not being able to separate it. They're like, you're, yeah. you're not you. You're the singer who sings for me. Keep singing. Absolutely. Look at this. We're unpacking some stuff here. 100%. So were you in Star Wars? Because we need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I, yeah. I almost forgot about that. Um, yeah, I, 
I was part of this agency and um, they sent me this request for a few weeks on, on this project. And I was like, oh, okay, what is it? And they said, we can't tell you, you're just going to have to turn up Always and do a, a fitting. Sign. Always a good sign. So I turn up and I do this fitting and I'm walking down this hallway and suddenly I see like, um, I don't know, Stormtrooper legs and oh. pictures of, you know, the, the Millennium Falcon. And I'm like, where the hell am I? What's going on? And then yeah. it all became very apparent. And uh, that was phenomenal. The the whole team, the the, the crew, the director, um, everyone was so nice. Oh yeah? my goodness, so nice. That's awesome. And they, the, I I kind of go. I love food, of course, but the, they they brought their own food people over, and so they had like jerk. At the time, I, I'm vegan now, but at the time, I was eating fish and chicken and all sorts. Mm-hmm. And they had like jerk chicken and just an amazing menu. Dude. And Harrison Ford would come over to get his own food because he liked he was like that. He just liked to come mingle a little bit and go back to his trailer and do what he was doing. Sure. And um, everyone was just so super nice though. And uh, yeah, I played a, a this kind of intergalactic gangster type uh, called Russell Weno, like it. a soldier. And uh, at the time, I had no idea uh, that's what they were going to do. Um, but it was great, and I saw myself in books. And then I went off and done signings for a few things after after the film came out. And again, that was another turning point, which I yeah, which which really helped. Um, with some recognition um, in terms of my screen presence and what I can do and so on. I bet. And, and it was, even though it was very quick, uh, even, even though it was very kind of simple when you watch the film, quite easy uh, and straight, straight, you know, I was just in and out kind of thing. Uh, people still kind of connect with it and reach out to me, which was phenomenal. Absolutely. That's kind of the, the magic of Star Wars is everyone matters, you know, because it's one of those like, universes where the guy in the back corner has a story and there'll be a book about him later and everyone needs to know. Yeah. And and you're that guy. And you had a cool hat. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you just you're just winning left and right. That you realize you said a sentence that involved Harrison Ford, right? Like that you experienced. Oh I just, yeah. I just I just we need to we need to unpack this cuz that is huge. <laughs> what is what well, is your life? Well, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, I, um, I really enjoyed that project, especially because I mean, we were in this studio uh, most of the time, and in the middle of the studio was a massive fire where they're spit roasting this ginormous uh, alien turkey, uh, like the size of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Um, um, and it it got so hot in there at times. Um, but everyone was just so understanding and people would run out and fan you and give you water. And uh, uh, the, 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 the main cast would, you know, you could have a little chat in the, in the gaps and they were just, just lovely. So I definitely, I definitely remember that experience um, really touching me, you know? Sure, sure. I mean, it's, you know, the biggest franchise in the history of ever. That's when you know you're doing pretty well in your, in your acting journey. When you look over and see like John Boyega, Daisy Ridley, Harrison Ford, just hanging out, you're like, "Oh, yeah, okay, this is my life now. Yeah. I'm changed." So that's kind of changed forever. So when you're working on, so when you're working on EastEnders, right? Something that's been around since you know the dawn of television. <laughs> how how was going on to a set like that so early in your acting career and being like, "Oh, this is this is what made TV here." Because I'm curious as to like you're you're getting thrown into the deep end pretty much everything that you're doing. You're like, let's sing a little bit. Okay, number one, you're gonna start acting. All right, Eastenders. Like, how do you? Is yep. your brain just like that that you can able, you you can adapt very quickly? Yeah, I guess the universe is looking out for me. I kind of uh, definitely get thrusted into these things where I'm, I'm either gonna sink or swim. Um, yeah. And uh, you know what? If I'm being honest, it comes from the martial arts um, kind of background. Like our instructors, you know, and these, you know, when you're like a teenager, these are your formative years, so you hang on every word. Yes. And, it, it, and and so they're like, you know, go out there with this indomitable spirit and and never be defeated and feel like you can achieve anything because you can. And I kind of felt like looking at where my family came from, in Jamaica, having no money um, to come over here and 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 to educate themselves and to have property and to build there's the only way is up like why would i not do my best 
when I'm thrusted into these situations. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And the 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 other side is that it was hard when when I um got the call to do the tryout for EastEnders. I was struggling financially. I was at, at my mum's place sleeping on the floor because my brother was there with his partner and there was no there were no rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was t- it was a real tough time. And I was still just pushing, pushing, and pushing. And I got this phone call. Hey, what are you doing like Wednesday? We need you to go up to uh, Boreham Wood. There's a, a, a casting for senders. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, we need you. They're looking for market traders. They, they, they like you. You've got to get over there. I'm like, okay, no problem. Let's do this. Get over there. Boom. It's a done deal. Um, and so for me, I was just thankful. It didn't matter what it was going to be. I'm going to find a way to do it. <laughs> yeah. What else is there? I agree. I agree. I also have this theory that, like, anyone who's had, like, a rough childhood or anything like that, or who knows what it's like to be hungry and knows what it's like to go without, you almost owe it to yourself to give it your all and to, like, kind of make your own destiny from here on out. Because, like you're saying, you know what it's like to have nothing, so there's only one way to go up. And it's, it's almost like a disservice to everything that you've been through to not go for it. And to reach for what's out of reach, you know. I agree with you. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I think it's a it's like an innate thing uh, that, like, if you're if you're given everything, then you don't necessarily have as much of an appreciation for it, you know, because it's not earned. But then when you do earn it, and then you you also you've had your metal tested quite a bit. Now that we're thinking about it, because, <laughs> because it's like you know, it's like luck is preparation meets opportunity. So it's like when you're given these opportunities, you're still meeting them head on and you have what it takes. Otherwise, you'd be met with the opportunity and then it would just fall flat. So that's kind of cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is a service I provide. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just I look at your life and find the thread and I'm like, that's pretty cool. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Especially with the martial arts. Like I love that martial arts has, has been this thread that's had – benefits that people aren't necessarily talking about all the time when they talk about martial arts you know when you think of martial arts typically you think about self-defense and fighting but it's like there's so much more gain from it and i love that it's influenced music and acting and art and everything that you've been doing kind of neat absolutely because um you know most of us that start martial arts we're not necessarily going to be cage fighters or um you know sports leaders in in the field sure um but it, it, there's the opportunity for for us to allow it to impact our lives in a real positive way, and uh, yeah, for sure, it's it's been the case with me. I recommend it. Have you have you ever been punched in the head like real bad? Yeah, I've been yeah. punched and kicked in the in the head real bad. I've Ooh. been, uh, you know, when I was doing a lot more striking arts, uh, punched and kicked all over the body generally. <laughs> as sure. you, as yeah. you, you know, busted lip. Um, yeah. Or, fractures and and stuff but um with jujitsu there's less of that um because we can tap ah then, smart yeah and initially it plays with your ego cause of you think, course I ain't, I ain't tapping for nobody nobody's gonna tap me yeah. <laughs> um that only goes for so long <laughs> it only goes for so long <laughs> and then you start to realize the beauty in being able to tap in that you get to learn from your mistakes and try again and when you start applying it to life, it it's a special a special thing for sure. I agree. I agree. Build your resilience physically and more importantly mentally, because you wait until the last possible second before tapping, and then you find out what you're made of, and then you learn from it. So it's all cumulative experience. Kind of neat. Yeah, kind of neat indeed. I was grappling one time with a dude, and I knew the second that he got me into the lock where it was gonna go. It's like one of those like. There's a part of an arm bar when you're like, okay, there's only one way this goes. Before, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a point of no return. And I remember before it even got to the point where there was like leverage involved, I immediately tapped him, like, all right, this is this just how it goes. Like, I know where this is going. You've got me here. We're 95% of the part right before it starts hurting. Here you go. And he got so mad because he wasn't able to like make me tap by force because I recognized the losing battle. And then I, in turn, got in trouble for that, because they're like, you got to go to the point of no return first. I was like, okay, fair. I know what I've learned here. So you robbed him of the uh, opportunity to... I did, to... yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
That's what he gets. <laughs> <laughs> the victory should be in knowing you got me in that position to begin with. He's like, no, I wanted to see the pain first. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go over here. I also got punched in the ear one time, and that hurts really bad. No, it's not nice. It's not yeah. nice to get punched anywhere. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You know, if the person can really punch, it's just not nice. Yeah, that's right. So you've done you've done fight work as well on screen. Yeah, I, I did a, a, a show called um, New Blood, which is about these detectives in the UK. And I'm a, a big Turkish, uh, I'm in this Turkish bath and I'm a big gangster that comes out and chucks a few people around. And I get hit over the head with a metal dustbin. What? How? Talk to me. Well, so um, these cops are in there trying to stake out the joint and they find who they're after and uh, they, they try to bring them in. And I'm like, you ain't taking anyone anywhere. Yeah. I come out with just a towel wrapped around me. Because <laughs> I'm in a Turkish bath, right? Love it. And I'm grabbing these guys and I'm throwing them into sun loungers and all this kind of stuff. And he manages to crawl out into this passageway and find a dustbin. And just as I almost get him, he smashes me over the head with it and, uh, and man manages to get away, which was so much fun. Dude, that's why you got Union Jack. They're like, he's wrestled before. Look, he took a dustbin like a champ. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real dustbin you really got hit in the head so it was um they they kind of you know they put this thing together so it looked like a real one and it was heavy enough you know it had foam and stuff on it and um so i had to kind of brace for the impact and and, and take it like a man yeah but, there uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully it wasn't real metal um but yeah that's falling so cool. on on the floor because because i'm in a towel as well right i can't have too many pads and all that kind of stuff so i just had to fall and take it sure uh, how'd the towel stay on then oh they by the magic of television um, <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. uh they the, the the makeup ladies the uh the, the stylist they um sold it all onto me oh that's so cool thankfully <laughs> <laughs> otherwise they need a, a different rating for the uh that's right that show, that's right sure. i mean you have a background in erotic art so just saying you kind of came from yeah. you know? You know, I really enjoyed doing all of that. And not for the obvious. It was um, just connecting with the models. Um, of course. Very, yeah, just, just hearing their stories and some of the things they've done. And, and finding ways to, to be really uh, classy and uh, creative with what I was doing. So I got really into um, using light to cast shadows. And just, yeah. it was more about, but yeah. I got into that whole thing, silhouettes and stuff. Um, That's so cool. So that, that was really a lot of fun. Because it's a specific type of art as well. That requires, it's like, you know people say you have an eye for something? Like, that's one of those. It's a very specific, you have it or you don't. It's going to be classy or it isn't. Like, there's not, yeah. a, there's not a whole lot of gray area, uh, pun intended with the shadows, uh, involved in that type of medium. So it, I just love that all, everything you've done has been cumulative. Like, you've got martial arts experience, which prepared you mentally for the music, which you grew up listening to, and then you were able to do that. Then the fact that the art was the camera that put you in front of it, that made you go into acting. That's so cool. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, I'm just open. I'm just open to embracing these opportunities, because the bigger picture is that we don't know how long we got on this, this rock, man. Tell you me know, this... about it. <laughs> Let's just do stuff. I agree. I have that like ticking clock in the back of our heads, you know, where it's like we don't have time. It's like get, get in there and express yourself as much as possible and get the most out of life that you can. I think it's important to be open to opportunities and new experiences and also kind of get to know yourself. You know, I feel like a lot of people don't really explore themselves and realize the multifacets that we have and then to see what those do. It seems to be pretty rewarding in my experience. Yeah. 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 Is there something that you want to do that you haven't done yet? Like on your on your list? You're like, this would be cool. There are a few things I'd like to do. You know, I, I've always wanted to just spend like three months or something in Japan or... Um, I love Japan. Never been. Some, always wanted I, to. I, I've been. I've been what? And, What's it like? Well, first of all, you notice that the people are just so friendly and just willing to help. I remember coming off... Um, some shuttle somewhere trying to find my hotel and I was absolutely lost and uh, at the time I couldn't see any signs that were helping I didn't have any um, internet to use my phone or anything sure and this woman came out of her job like she was working and she saw I was lost and she mumbled something to her manager who it was she said and and she couldn't speak English uh, properly 
but she just said, look, I showed her where I wanted to go and she took me pretty much to my hotel and then went back to work. That's and I thought, cool. And I was like, wow, I love this place already. Yeah, um, right off the bus. I, <laughs> right off the bus. And I was staying in Tokyo. I was in Shibuya mostly, um, oh, doing cool. lots of meetings around music, music, really. I was doing a lot of music publishing meetings and stuff. And so that it was very busy and it just didn't stop, you know, like nighttime all the way through. There was just something going on always. And the thing that always stuck with me randomly was people go out like businessmen would get drunk after work and fall asleep on a bench uh, and no one, <laughs> no one would like take their keys or phone or anything. They'd just like leave them, just leave them alone. Oh my <laughs> God. They like... see him and just pat him. Me too, buddy. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Just passed out businessmen in Japan. Yeah. Dude. But I'd love to, I'd love to live in that part of the world generally for a good few months or even a year or, or so or more yeah. and travel around. Uh, going to Singapore, I love it there. Oh, um, and cool. also, yeah, it's another place I'd, I'd love to spend more time at. Just because it's easy to get to then, let's say, Australia or Hong Kong or the, all the surrounding areas. Yeah. Indonesia and all that, so Thailand and so on. I hear you. I hear you. Especially in the States. It's like, oh, man, that is on the other side of the planet. Yeah. That's, that's what, I've always wanted to go to Australia for that reason. Just to be like, oh, yeah, you know, Earth, I've been on the other side of it. So, <laughs> you know, Not yet, but one day. One day. Do you have actually? I want to talk about your book. So, what made you want to write a book? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I felt like inside I had a lot going on that I needed to let out, and the book seemed like the best way. So, I started blogging, um, and then I left it for a while. Mm -hmm. And being really into business, yeah, um, I thought to myself. I've spent so much time being creative. Let me go and do some courses and, and keep learning and develop some skills in this area. And I, I read a book. A friend of mine recommended a book called Entrepreneur Revolution by Daniel Priestley. Love it. And I read it, checked it out, loved it, made sense, and went to one of his events and thought, you know, I'm going to do this guy's course. So I did the six-month, I think it was like a threshold thing. Um, and it was all right. You know, I, learned, I, took, I took a lot from it. What I took from it the most was some great new friends who had a similar approach and mindset business wise. Mm -hmm. um, and then how I recognized how important it was to, to, to have content out and how to, and, and to, to, to be writing and, and putting out stuff packed with value all the time. Right. Um, so yeah, they, they do a course where you can go off and they help you write a book. But I thought, no, I'm going to continue my blogging thing and just write my I kind of felt like I wanted to write this book um, because I needed to get my own thoughts together about what the next steps were going to be for me. Sure. That makes sense. My, yeah. And then also to offer some ideas to people that may be tr treading a, a, a similar road to then maybe take it and then find their own way, you know, with some of this information that I have, I have from my experiences. Right. And that's that's how the book came about. That makes sense. How long did it take you to write it? It didn't take that long, actually. It took me maybe about two months, two or three months. Wow, that's super fast. Um, I would. I just got into this flow of every day writing, say a thousand words, just you know, just just writing it, and then figuring out what I wanted to keep, what I wanted to get rid of. And I, I, I wasn't worried about going. Yeah, I'm going to make it a hundred thousand words. And I was just like, okay these are the chapters I feel are really important. This is, these are the questions I feel arise. And these, these are the answers I feel are important to include. And that's it. It doesn't matter to me how many words it's going to be. It's all, all about, you know, the, um, sure. Uh, more than anything. So you're done when you're done. Not nah, you're done. You're done when you're done. That's right. That's right. We commit in this house. That's what we do. That's what we do all day. Yeah. All day, every day. Tell your friends. We don't sleep. We established that we earlier. Sleep. There's no sleeping. This is a no, <laughs> no sleep sleeping. household here. That's what it is. That's right. That's pretty cool, though. I, I, uh, I don't think I have the attention span to write a book. I read them, but that's very, very commendable to be able to. And it's got to be cool as well to have something on top of all your other work that's like you can hold in your hands. You know, you're like, I made this. Yeah, um, that was really neat, and I, I did. I went off and I did the audio book for it as well. That's so cool! Um, you have a great voice, by the way. Thank you so I'm much. I'm just man. gonna say it. You got a good one. I do not, so I commend you for yours. Well done. 
No, not at all, man. I appreciate it. And I, 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 earlier this year, I started a voiceover agency so I could be in more control of my own voice career. Sweet. And, yeah, and, and signed a few other artists and we're really working hard, pushing the, pushing the agency and having fun doing it. It's, it's phenomenal. I bet. Look, look at you being even more multifaceted. You know, it's, I just feel like it's just an extension of the th- way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. You know? I agree. It's all and it's all performance as well. I th- I think we've established that you're a performer at heart. I am, right? You know, <laughs> we got <laughs> we got a lot of proof here backing it up. There's a lot of proof. A yeah. performer, and a creative. Yep. It, I mean, those are the best kinds. If you have a lot to say, and then you get it out, and then people connect with it, and that's what it's all about, really. And that. So, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to get into the kind of stuff that you're getting into? Oh, which which Bits of the stuff. Good question. <laughs> Let's say all of it. <laughs> well, so music. Let's say music, because that's a specific industry as well. If anyone wants to get into music, what advice would you have for them? The great thing today with when it comes to music is um, it's so much easier to connect with you. I think it's really important to figure out why you're doing it. You know, what's your big idea? What's the the reason for it all? Sure. I agree you with that. You know what I mean? Have something to say. Have something to say. Um, have, a, have a bigger picture for you and, and why it all connects and be willing to be flexible about how that can change. Oh yeah. And, you know, have, yeah. And, and factor in regular points to assess how that's all going, you know? And, uh, that's definitely the first thing because some people, yeah, I want to be a singer. I've got a great voice. Well, okay. What are you going to do when you have no money and the bailiffs are knocking at your door Yeah, and you know, all of this kind of stuff, how are you going to pay your bills? And um, you have family and, you know, and then there's also how you kind of beca- develop that resilience, you know, when people uh, don't want to hear your music or you're trying really hard and you can't get how you're building with a mindset of giving, you know, some people just want to take, take, take. Like, how are you creating win-win situations for the people that you're networking with? Because that's, that's, that's really going to make a difference with regards to heading towards sustainability. So I think the main thing for me would be to encourage people think about sustainability how are you going to make it work long term that makes sense and especially like you're saying just because you can sing well that like that's only part of it there's a whole other side with resilience and having something to say and like also how are you going to stand out i feel like is an important thing uh to know before getting into it that way you don't get up on stage and then you're like oh this is this is all i had yeah yeah absolutely and burnout just i think at the heart of it for me is wellness um figuring out how you can do all of these things, but, but be healthy, you know, so you can enjoy it for as long as possible with a, a, a reasonable quality. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that because you're so worried about the work that you're not thinking about the instrument, which is you. Because you can have all the drive in the world, but if you can't, if you don't have the health to, to run the race, then you're not going to make it very far. Yeah, and th- again, this is what I talk about in my book, you know, just those, those things because like you said, we don't think about it so much. We just think, yeah, I'm gonna uh, be a number one, and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna get a red Lamborghini, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> buy houses for everyone in my family. And then you're like, okay, but are, are you resting? Are you working out? Are you taking enough water? Uh, what? Who are who are the people in your circle? Are they negative? Are they real but encouraging? You know, like all those little small practical things that help you just keep going, help you stay buoyant. Sure. Uh, so you can achieve those goals. Because unless you can achieve all those goals in the year then <laughs> it's a it's a little <laughs> bit of a different it's a marathon not a sprint it's a marathon. yeah man 100 percent, dude well i mean having talked to you now for an hour i uh i have no doubt why you've made it this far and i'm very excited to see what you do next because you're just like i said you're one of those people that have multi facets upon facets and i enjoy everything you've done Listen, I, I, once again, I really appreciate the, the support and the encouragement. And please stay in touch, you know. Dude, of course. And, uh, and, where, so uh, where can people get your book? You can get it on Amazon. It's called How to Think Beyond the Chart Position. I love it. Um, it's available there. Um, also on Audible. Yes. And Yeah, my website is spoonface.net. Love it. And uh, Instagram, spoonface1, spoonface1. I'm there. That's what I'm talking about. Get that search engine optimization. You got the, you've, you've cornered the spoon face market, and I respect that. 
Thank you. Of course, you so of course, much. dude. This was really, really fun. I hope you've had a good time. I've, I've really, really enjoyed it, and I, I appreciate you coming on. Likewise, man. Sweet. Likewise, hundred percent. If you got anything else coming up, you let me know. For sure, I'll keep you posted. So right good. on. This was so cool. Thanks again. And. Thank you, Brian. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites, as well as BrianBalance.com. That is balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. That's right. Just search The Interesting Podcast on TeePublic to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, and Victor. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>